Jim, thank you very much. Um, delighted to be here this evening. Delighted to be sharing this rather interesting and, for me, quite difficult topic. I was intrigued to read the results of the poll and find out just how important so many companies think system change really is. That's fantastic. Something like 82%, I think, came in there. I was even more intrigued, but I must admit, fairly baffled by the fact that 52% of the companies that responded to the survey felt that they already had a system-changing initiative on the go. Now, to be honest, in Forum for the Future, charitable though we are, we would think it quite difficult to pinpoint that percentage of companies doing system-changing initiatives at the moment, and maybe we'll get into some of that stuff. What really are we talking about? when we talk about a system-changing initiative, because it's bound to be a little bit less clear than you might think. It reminded me of the Accenture survey, of course, that came out three years ago, where roughly 82% of the chief executives that were polled said that their company had already fully mainstreamed sustainability into their company. That is the definition of a questionnaire that is not filled in by a chief sustainability officer. <laughs> the poll was also very interesting, because it identified the fact that as far as our audience was concerned for the survey, people allocated responsibility for system changing roughly 50-50 between government on the one hand and business on the other hand. In fact, the phrase that was used was that government and business were neck and neck when it came to responsibility for making the system change. Now, that sounds great to me in theory, I think in practice, we all know that these are very different necks that we're talking about. Corporate necks often are stuck out there and often are, as a consequence of taking quite high levels of risk, they are often cut off. Government necks, it seems to me, of the brass kind, basically, are largely stuck up their own fundamentals <laughs> and not really out there in any discernible sense whatsoever. And one of the things I know we need to unpack this evening is what does it mean to have equal responsibility in today's world between government and business to effect real, substantial, lasting systems change? What does that really mean when most governments seem extremely reluctant to change even the basics? But we're all here because we know how important this is. We're all here because we know that brilliant solo stories, by which I mean solo corporate stories, However inspiring they may be, and however encouraging to other companies, other organizations indeed, to get on and do more, we know it's not enough. We know that a handful of companies that commit to being 100% powered by renewable energy by 2020 is great, something to celebrate, but clearly not enough. We know that one or two companies deciding to get rid of toxics in their supply chain is great, but clearly not enough. We know that companies that commit to increase transparency throughout their supply chain is brilliant, but on its own, not enough. A handful of factories, are, uh, companies are doing brilliant things with their factories in countries like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and so on. But every now and then, we get a Rana Plaza look-alike to remind us how utterly, woefully, pathetically inadequate each of those solo stories is when set against systemic injustice of that kind. So we know the solo stories are not going to get us to the point where we really want to be. And we know from that perspective that firstly we need to come together more effectively and secondly as a consequence of coming together we need to achieve this system change. Three aspects of this that I'm sure we'll touch on this evening. Firstly, by system change we hope that we can achieve much bigger scale, that we really can affect change at a larger level than even a small number of companies working together. We know that we can reach further through system change if companies come together and do things differently and bring into their own consortia representatives of civil society, of government, of academia, of different professions, design, engineering, whatever it might be, we know that it's possible to reach out and make those messages work even harder. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, that kind of system change is pretty important to guarantee durability it won't have escaped your attention that very often what looks like a really big and encouraging substantive change can actually disappear quite easily 
at some point in the future. Durability, stickability is really critical. And the more you can change the system, and the more people who get involved in that change process, the better it is. So in every respect, I think we all know um, how difficult this is. Indeed, if you didn't know how difficult this is, you probably wouldn't be here this evening. But I was very struck by the fact when I was reading through all the blogs that we were able to have as part and parcel of this crowdsourcing for this evening, and I think, Jim, this is an excellent way of getting so many different inputs into this, I was very struck by the degree to which quite a lot of those blogs indicated that what we're talking about at, as system change at the moment probably isn't going far enough, even though we know how difficult it is transactionally, how difficult it is in practical terms, how difficult it is to overcome some of the incumbent vested interests in the system. And Gail's blog, and you'll be hearing from her, her shortly, opened with that very sobering quote from Machiavelli reminding us that for a very long time, those who hold the reins of power have the power to ensure that nobody takes the reins out of their hands. Dealing with incumbency, dealing with vested interests in the system is a massive part of this. So I think the prompt that was coming through the blogs, some quite interesting questioning about whether the way we talk about system change at the moment is actually robust enough, radical enough, stretching our imaginations enough. I really like that challenge. And I'm just going to touch on two of those because I thought they were particularly interesting. Firstly, from Joe Sway. I hope I've pronounced that roughly all right, whose blog was fascinating, and I invite you to have a look at that if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet, from the Academy for Systemic Change, good organizational name, you've got to like that, who quite rightly pointed out that it is part of our experience that we know the harder you push in a certain system, the harder the system pushes back. So how clever are we really being at handling some of those very powerful oppositional forces that our engagement often exacerbates, creates indeed, sometimes in the system? And he quoted from Peter Senge, and I just invite you to ponder this quote. I don't actually know what this quote means, but I am really struck by it, and I'm hoping it'll come up round your tables this evening. What is most systemic is most personal. That's deep. <laughs> Peter is often deep. But what does that mean? Are we really succeeding in touching that whole dimension of a deeper values-based personal approach towards system change? Many instances, we're not. And secondly, the a blog from John Alexander from the New Citizenship Project, who was pretty out there saying, come on, guys, wise up. At the moment, a lot of this system change seems to be directed towards the individual as the consumer. And he refers there somewhat disparagingly, I have to admit, to the fact that we're very keen on a revolution in material flows through the economy, but not a revolution in terms of mindsets. And I thought it was very important that he reminded us all that language is not just a collection of words strung together for a particular communications purpose. Language is what he calls the scaffolding on which we build deep ideas, philosophical, ideological ideas, which help convey very different images of what change in the world really means. And he quotes from that extremely well-known study where the only difference between the two cohorts in the study, the only difference between they, the way they were described is one was called a consumer response study and one was called a citizen response study. And the people who were in the citizen response study were much more enthusiastic about their ability to change the system. Whereas those in the consumer response study, sort of a bit mangy about it really. Very limited ambition level. Now, I have to admit I have a certain amount of sympathy for this approach personally. And for those who read my little blog, you will have noticed that I indulged myself a little bit by going into the world we made kind of time travel effect. It's what I often do when I find the present really very difficult to deal with. And zipped ahead to 2022 and invited people to think about the degree to which our current approach to system change is really grappling with political realities in the world today. 
So this is Alex Mackay looking back from June 22. This isn't in the book, by the way. It's just invented for now. It took everyone a very long time to understand just how completely governments had lost the plot in the first decade of this century. 25 years of the crudest neoliberal ideology had profoundly corrupted the body politic. Their shtick went something like this. If it moves, privatize it. Marketize it, monetize it. Shrink the size of the state at all costs. Use our good friends in the media to demonize taxation and then move to minimize the burden of taxation on both our friends, wealthy individuals, and companies. Constantly tell people that in such a complex, interconnected world, the state can do less and less, apart from maintain our armed forces and security services. Regulation should always be seen as the policy instrument of last resort, a wretched constraint on wealth creators and the free market. And the truth of it is, this is Alex Mackay writing in 22, that this meta-messaging worked unbelievably well. At exactly the time when governments were needed more than ever to address the emerging crises of climate change, grotesque inequality, and so on, they disappeared. They played no part at all in this in that early decade. And then this is the last para, but this is most relevant to our topic this evening. Until about 2015... This is where my hopefulness creeps in. Businesses more or less went along with this ideological folly, with lots of business leaders still whinging on about the burden of red tape and regulation. Even those companies that were doing a cracking job on sustainability were prone to rather pathetic spasms of deregulatory overexcitement. the calamitous failure of governments at the climate change conference in Paris in 2015 changed all that. Now, I am indeed wanting to put a little bit of pressure on here because I am concerned that many companies today seem to have almost persuaded themselves that a combination of their own corporate muscle plus brilliant, creative, ever more pluralistic partnerships will be sufficient to the task of achieving system change. That is a miserable illusion. It is a miserable illusion. And we have got to think more strategically about what we do to bring governments back into the fold, how companies can use their public affairs muscle to ensure that governments are part of this process, not hanging out there looking on in wonder at what the corporate world is really doing. So that's where I'm hoping some of our discussion might go this evening in all sorts of different ways. But, of course, I'm sharing this process with three panelists who may well decide to take the discussion in three completely different directions. And I can assure you I will not be able to control any of that um, any more than you will. So the deal is now I'm going to ask our three panelists to come and join me here on the stage.